Greetings, super friends. In this lecture, we're gonna talk about the power of preparation and how you can use preparation to actually accelerate your learning and make things go faster and easier when you do set out to learn. Now, this originally appeared as a chapter in my forthcoming book, and we converted it into a lecture from the Super Learner Masterclass. So if you hear me reference later on in this course, ignore all of that and enjoy this free preview from the Super Learner Masterclass. Oftentimes, when we sit down to learn, we are full of excitement, passion, and enthusiasm. We are eager to dive in, to sink our teeth into this new subject, and give it our best shot. But the truth is that while it's great to have enthusiasm for learning, enthusiasm without planning can do more harm than good. A few years ago, I decided that I was going to learn my fourth language, Russian. Why Russian? Well, first and foremost, I was passionate about it. Second of all, as an up-and-coming expert in accelerated learning, I wanted to demonstrate the power of the memory skills I was teaching every single day by learning a relatively difficult language. Third, considering that I already speak a Germanic language, English, a Latin language, Spanish, and a Semitic language, Hebrew, I wanted to try something really different. Plus, I wanted to make sure to fulfill all of the pressing need cr criteria, and there aren't very many native Mandarin speakers in Israel, unlike Russian speakers. With the naive goal of learning Russian by the end of the year, I dove in with a fury. I memorized both alphabets, cursive and block, and their pronunciations in a few days. I memorized hundreds and hundreds of new vocabulary words in a few short weeks. I began studying the grammar and forming basic sentences. I even learned to touch type in Russian. I was on fire. A few months later, I landed in Moscow, eager to flaunt my new language skills with my Russian friends. I was in for a rude awakening. On the train from Demodedovo Airport to the city center, I noticed an advertisement for Citibank. As it turns out, Citibank's slogan in Russia at the time was a very friendly one. Citibank, always with you, always for you. Except in Russian, it was written like this. Citibank. Всегда с вами, всегда для вас. Wait, what? I understood most of the words, and even their choice to use the collective, formal version of you. This was a concept I knew from my prior knowledge of the Spanish word usted. But why were they using two different words for the word you? Oh, crap. As it turns out, in all my study of Russian, I had neglected to understand one crucial element. There are about six ways to say every word and pronoun in Russian, depending on the context. But that's not all. I quickly learned that my vocabulary list, which I thought was organized by importance, was clearly not. Whereas I knew such useful words as trubka, tube, and mieshuk, sack, I did not know the difference between vhod, entrance, and vihod, exit. As you can imagine, the security guards at the Kremlin were less than amused. What had gone wrong? Poor planning. Instead of sitting down to get a broad overview of the Russian language, a view of the forest from 30,000 feet, I had gone straight for the trees. Rather than developing a plan for how I would shift between vocabulary and grammar or transition from one grammatical case to another, I simply jumped in at what looked like the beginning. And to this day, I am still a below average Russian speaker because of it. This concept, the idea of preparing and structuring your learning in a logical way before you even start, comes up a lot in accelerated learning circles. In his accelerated learning book, disguised as a cookbook, The Four Hour Chef, life hacker extraordinaire Tim Ferriss shares his two frameworks for preparing to learn anything faster. Dis, deconstruction, How small can I break things down into their basic units of learning, such as individual vocabulary words or grammatical rules? Selection, what are the 20% of those units that will give me 80% of the benefits? Pareto's principle. Sequencing, what is the best order in which to learn these units? Stakes, how can I use psychology or social pressure to condense my timelines and push myself to learn faster? Using this preparation process, alongside the other techniques you're learning in this course, Ferris has become an accomplished author, 
a successful investor, a household name podcaster, a skilled chef, a champion sumo wrestler, and a record holding tango dancer. Whatever you're learning, thinking ahead is key. Recently, when I interviewed Zach Evans, creator of the popular Piano Superhuman Accelerated Learning course, he told me a very similar story. Zach explained to me that a significant portion of the success he generates for his students lies in simply thinking ahead, breaking things down into individual skills or sections, and then tackling them in the right order. Zach also pointed out that unless we plan out our learning in a methodical and deliberate way, we fall prey to bad habits, wasted time, or complacency. Zach himself learned this by accidentally leaving his camera recording during a practice session only to find out that he had wasted the entire two hours playing pieces he had already mastered. So before you begin to study a new subject, there are a number of questions that you must ask yourself. These questions will not only help you determine the most efficient way to learn something, though, as you'll see when we get into the almost annoyingly effective memory techniques later on in the course, learning something the wrong way can have irreversible consequences later down the line. Here are some questions that I encourage you to spend time considering before diving in to any learning project. Why am I learning this information and how and when will I actually use it? The first among these questions not only checks off a few requirements for our dear old friend, Dr. Knowles, it also helps us determine just what we're going to focus on in the first place. Chances are, you're not learning Russian to communicate with construction workers, so learning words like trubka are probably not worth your time. If, however, you're learning Russian to be able to travel freely within the former USSR, then you should probably prioritize basic grammar and practical words like exit and entrance. Next, what level of understanding or knowledge do you need? One question that I've long felt is missing from the conversation on preparation is that of depth. There are many levels of understanding and knowledge, ranging from being able to recall when something sounds right, to basic recall of facts, a holistic understanding, or at the highest levels, actually being able to think originally and independently on a subject. To what level do you need to know the information you are learning? Do you need to be able to recite other people's works word for word and challenge them for your PhD thesis? Or do you simply need to know where to look something up the next time a patient presents those symptoms? The extent to which you need to know something dramatically changes the way that you will go about learning it and how much time you'll spend on it. Up next, how can this information be broken down into small parts and recombined into broader categories or themes? What are the units of information in this subject? Are they verses of a poem, functions in a programming language, chords on an instrument, or words in a lexicon? Once you've determined these divisible elements, are you able to classify them into broader themes, such as historical periods, key signatures, or parts of speech? Next, what are the most important things to learn based on my personal goals? As you likely know, Pareto's law states that 80% of the benefits are derived from 20% of the work. Unless you're looking to become the world's best at something, this generally means that you can save yourself the effort on a great majority of the information in any given subject. In music, most of us can probably skip learning the individual frequencies and physics of each note, just like most non-native English speakers shouldn't bother with the future perfect continuous case. Up next, what is the right order in which to learn this information? Learning a heap of grammatical rules doesn't make a lot of sense if you don't know enough words to form a single sentence. Similarly, it's probably not very useful to learn to read music until you know which keys play which notes. As I learned when I tackled Russian, the order in which you learn things really matters, and you can never reclaim the time spent learning the wrong things. Next, how will I actually access this information? Knowing how you'll access the information you're learning is often just as important as knowing which information to learn. When I began studying Russian, for example, I made the mistake of organizing my memory palaces, a powerful tool that you'll learn elsewhere in this course, alphabetically. But how often do you write out a sentence and think to yourself, what I really need here is something that starts with a K? More likely, you're searching for either a noun, a verb, an adverb, or something like that. It wasn't until David, a star super learner student who now speaks seven languages, shared his own organizational method with me that I realized my mistake. If you're studying for the bar exam, do you need to access laws by the order in the penal code? 
Probably not. More than likely, you need to know what type of law they pertain to. Memorizing in this way is a very different and much more useful project. The next question, what will your study schedule look like and how can you compress timelines? As Tim Ferriss teaches in his books, Parkinson's Law states that work expands to fill the time you allot it. We all know the feeling of writing an entire semester's final paper in a matter of days or hours. So why not use this nifty psychological hack to our advantage? By structuring our study sessions in methodical ways based on the answers to the questions above, we ensure consistency and persistence. Plus, by adding high stakes, social pressure, and condensed timelines to the mix, we kick ourselves into high gear. My friend, Dr. Benjamin Hardy, psychologist and author of the book Willpower Doesn't Work, calls these automatic constraints forcing functions. Want to learn acro yoga fast? Prepay for an advanced workshop three months from now. Hoping to learn a new technology at work? Volunteer to teach a workshop on it next quarter. By adding real-world stakes, you'll be motivated to structure your study plan and actually stick to it. The next question is equally important. How will I measure and track my progress? In order to determine whether or not you are moving forward at the right pace, it's important to have a clear metric of success. For this reason, I often teach students about the idea of SMART goals. Specific, measurable, ambitious, realistic, and time-based. If your goal is to get better at Excel, it's pretty hard to assess that. If your goal is to learn six new features of Excel, including pivot tables and macros by December 31st, you'll have a much easier time planning for success as you check off each individual feature. Plus, remember that what gets measured gets improved, but what gets measured and reported improves exponentially. Another question you should ask is what will I do if things don't go to plan? The last few questions will, with any luck, push you towards taking on some aggressive and ambitious learning goals and achieving them in record time. But the higher you shoot, the more likelihood there is of failure. And we all slip up sometimes. No matter how positive you are, nothing is more frustrating than watching your best laid plans fall apart. In these times, it's easy to spiral downward, beat yourself up, or give up altogether. That's why the best managers plan for occasional failures ahead of time. What exactly will you do if you fall off the bandwagon or get stuck on a particular subject? How will you get back on track and prevent one little slip up from derailing you and causing you to give up completely? A phenomenon that psychologists lovingly call the what the hell effect. Will you book extra sessions with a private tutor, make up time on the weekend, adjust your study schedule accordingly and give yourself some slack? By creating a specific action plan for what happens when you inevitably fall off track, you can minimize the damage and ensure that you waste as little time as possible. Armed with these nine questions, you are prepared to, well, prepare. You now understand why thinking ahead and creating a methodical success plan is far from a waste of time. In fact, it's quite possible that every minute of preparation will save you an hour or more of deliberation. That's why the next time you set out to cut down a learning tree, I know you'll take a good hard look at the forest first and then make sure your ax is razor sharp. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, I would really appreciate if you checked out my latest book, The Only Skill That Matters, which is currently on sale on Amazon and getting a ton of great press and reactions. I think you're really gonna enjoy the book, so make sure to check it out with the link below, and of course, like, subscribe, and comment below.